It's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to be able to introduce to you uh, Professor Paul Nimmo, who holds the King's Chair of Systematic Theology at the University of Aberdeen. He also holds a THM degree from this institution. I've known Paul for years. When Paul first came to me as a student, he was my advisee. And we sat in the dining room on the first day. And he'd, he'd come to us from Edinburgh where he studied with Professor James Mackey, a fairly liberal Catholic. And he said to me, um, I don't want to do any BART. And I said, well, that's <laughs> That's fine, that's fine. You, you don't need to do that. You can, you can do whatever you, you want to do. He said, I'm, I'm quite interested in your course on Schleiermacher. I said, well, you're welcome in that course. So he took it, and somewhere in the study of Schleiermacher, in that first semester, he found his way to Karl Barth. <laughs> Which I think is probably an indication that there's more of a connection there than people realize. But. At any rate, he is the author of an award-winning book. He received a John Templeton Award for Theological Promise in 2009 for his book on Bart's Ethics, uh, written in Edinburgh, uh, entitled Being in Action. He has worked for more than a decade as one of the editors and, and at one time the chief editor of the International Journal of Systematic Theology, one of our three most prominent English language theological journals. And he is a member, the co-chair at the moment, of the AAR Reform Theology and History Group Steering Committee, which I take delight in because I was actually there at the founding back in 1991. Willie Jennings and I and a few others created that thing. So it's great to see it in good hands, even if I never go to the AAR anymore. <laughs> at any rate, Paul, we welcome you uh, to give us a lecture this afternoon which you have entitled Marcus Bart on the Lord's Supper, an ecumenical dissenter. Paul. It's a very great pleasure to be here with you for this conference. And I'm very grateful indeed to Bruce McCormack, the director of the Bart Center, and to Kate Duggan, its curator, for the invitation to be here and for all their labors in arranging this event. My paper this afternoon addresses the theme of the Lord's Supper and explores the work of Marcus Bart on this topic with reference to its scriptural exegesis, its theological significance, and its ecumenical potential. Detailed work on Marcus Bart's contribution to the doctrine remains rather elusive, at least to my knowledge. And this paper thus seeks to contribute, at least in some small way, towards addressing that neglect. It proceeds in three main sections. First, I hope to set the scene for the investigation of Marcus Bart's work on the Lord's Supper by considering briefly the writings that are in view, their genre, and their purpose. Second, I engage in a close reading and analysis of key sections of Marcus Bart's mature writing on the Lord's Supper. And third, by way of conclusion, I explore the ecumenical ramifications of the teaching of Bart and position him as an ecumenical dissenter. So I begin by setting the scene. Marcus Bart produced not one, but two major works on the Lord's Supper in the course of his career. The first work is not well known. It was delivered as a lecture to the Reformed Convent of Pastors in Basel-Land in 1945 and appeared as a volume in the series Theologische Studien and has never been translated. The second work, which will provide the material focus for this paper, is well known to some. The underlying material was first given in a series of public lectures at first a seminary in Pittsburgh and second the seminary at Dubuque in 1986. The detailed underlying argument was published in the German work Das Mal des Herrn in 1987. A greatly abbreviated English version, in truth a paraphrase rather than a translation, called Rediscovering the Lord's Supper, appeared the following year. In terms of genre, Marcus Bart, as has been noted already, was first and foremost a distinguished New Testament scholar rather than a systematic theologian. 
to observe this is not in any way to downplay or overlook his ability or insight as a theologian. Both his works on the Lord's Supper are full of theological vision and demonstrate a keen knowledge of historical theology and of contemporary developments, conversing at different points with an array of systematicians. However, it remains the case that in both of these works, the primary object of analysis is the biblical text. The architecture of the work is structured around exegetical study, and the principal dialogue partners are scriptural exegetes. Indeed, at one point in the second work, he explicitly speaks of his task as being, to the best of his ability, to listen to the biblical witness and the polyphonic chorus of its interpreters. One might observe that Bart therefore inhabits the same kind of landscape of modern theology as we do, one governed by subdisciplinary silos of the kind regularly critiqued, yet seldom actually addressed in the contemporary academy. But there's more here, and that is Bart's insistence that precisely theological and practical advances in respect of the Lord's Supper are to be made on the basis of exegesis, and exegesis alone. He writes, Bible study is necessary whenever a church is open to being reformed by God's word and to rediscovering the meal instituted by Jesus Christ. The word rediscovering there is prophetic of his view of the supper, as we will see. We will see. There's thus a profound commitment to the Reformation teaching of sola scriptura, with all the implications that brings in respect of the relativization of church tradition, even as it relates to the early church. The result downstream is that one should not expect from Bart a treatment of the Lord's Supper that is systematic or comprehensive. Bart is not writing a dogmatic treatise, but conducting biblical exegesis. He leaves a dogmatician with work still to do in teasing out the wider theological implications of his interpretive decisions and to bring those decisions together within a larger doctrinal framework. As for purpose, Bart's writings on the Lord's Supper arise out of a real dissatisfaction with the current church teaching and practice in respect to the Lord's Supper, and this for multiple reasons. First, he laments the features of the way in which the Lord's Supper is currently celebrated. The meal is said to have a somber and depressing mood, to make its guests tremble, to create the impression that only individual salvation is in view, and to pay no attention either to the human body or to the wider society or to the whole creation. Second, he laments the obscurity of church discourse concerning the Lord's Supper, an infelicity arising from the artificial, technical language imported into the discussions. Bart comments by contrast, the simplicity of the New Testament vocabulary is striking. It's distinguished not only from the use of language in magical or mysterious rites, but also from the use of alien language in educated discussions about the Lord's Supper and in church confessions. And third, he laments the way in which the Lord's Supper has worked as a church dividing issue, not only within, but also between denominations as a means of excommunication. Bart laments that precisely the meal that is supposed to serve community and reconciliation causes more wounds and divisions than healings and reconciliations. It's fascinating to observe as an aside that the list of laments rehearsed in 1945 is almost exactly the same materially as the list of laments rehearsed in 1986. In the midst of such an uncompromising appraisal, Bart registers his own intervention, seeking a better way forward. And so we turn to its material substance and focus on Bart's mature view of the Lord's Supper from the mid-1980s. In setting out the contours 
and given the limits upon this paper, little more can be attempted here. In setting out the contours of Marcus Bart's mature view of the Lord's Supper, I'll follow the structure he himself deployed. I'll therefore consider in turn communion with Israel, communion with the crucified and coming one, and communion among the guests, before turning to look at the witness to Christ of John 6. So I begin with communion with Israel. The opening chapter of Bart's work on the Lord's Supper relates to the relationship between Christians and Jews in general, and between the Lord's Supper and the Passover in particular. His starting point is Ephesians 2.18. Through Christ we both have access to the Father in the one Spirit. And Bart comments that Gentile Christians, which we are, cannot give thanks at the table of the Lord God without the presence, accompaniment and participation of brothers and sisters from the people of Israel. This theme of connectedness with Israel is one of the central planks of Marcus Bart's exegesis and theology in general. It's thus of compelling importance to Bart that all three of the synoptic gospels position the last meal of Jesus as what he calls a carefully prepared and properly conducted Passover meal. Bart's aware that this view has encountered opposition exegetically, that some scholars have said that this Passover setting is a later accretion to the tradition. But what seems to frustrate him most is not actually that opposition to his view in itself, but the view that the Passover setting can be of no theological significance, even if it were true. By contrast, his own exposition, which brings this setting front and centre of the account of the Lord's Supper, renders it the framework in relation to which the earlier Pauline accounts are interpreted and posits that Passover is the context without which the Lord's Supper simply cannot be understood. Positively conceived, the Passover also exerts then from the outset a formal and material influence on Bart's own account. There follows in Bart's chapter a brief historical survey of the Passover in the Old Testament and in Phariseeism. He begins by observing that the celebration of the Passover takes place in memory of, or as a memorial to, a unique, complete and perfect act of God. But this trope of memory receives immediate qualification. On the one hand, Bart excludes the idea that remembering is simply a noetic activity. Instead, he has a much richer understanding of memory. Remembering is a holistic event that is noetic, yes, but also affective, corporeal and corporate. And on the other hand, the act of remembering is not in itself effective. In other words, he writes... Excluded is the idea that by remembrance, God's basic action is repeated, put into effect, validated, actualized, or applied, as if God's action were in need of, and in some sense dependent on, a religious ceremony. More bluntly, he notes, the Israelites are not first and only led out of Israel in the celebration of the Passover, Rather, they gather for the meal to celebrate the fact that they have been truly and effectually freed. <clears throat> In case the point wasn't clear yet, one more time, Bart says, it is a matter of gratitude for that which took place and is effective there and then, once for all time and for all those now present. For Bart, it's crucial that gratitude does not compromise the distinction between divine action and human action by identifying them or conflating them. It's this conception of the Passover meal as remembrance that is then, according to Bart's reading of the Synoptic Gospels, taken over by Jesus. Bart writes that Jesus approved and celebrated the feast as was common at his time, as would any contemporary pious father or host. As a result, 
The language of the accounts of the Lord's Supper refers to Israel's Bible and worship and thus underlines the bond between Israel and the church. Not only the framework, but also the conceptuality and the vocabulary of the celebration of the Lord's Supper has its roots in the worship of the people of Israel, attested in the Hebrew scriptures. At the same time, of course, Bart recognizes the way in which, for Christians, the Passover festival of the Jews is transformed. The object of memory now becomes not so much the historical event of Exodus in itself, but the person of Jesus. The feast is now to be repeated until his coming again in memory of him. But in line with the Passover, to speak of remembrance is not to speak of a continuous, ever new miracle that he will perform. Instead, it is his demand faith in himself and faithfulness in himself alone. Or again, transforming the function formerly fulfilled by the meat and by the blood of the Passover lamb is now replaced by the body and blood of Jesus. Now here the vexed question arises as to whether with the statements concerning his body and blood, Jesus gives himself at the table, as is claimed by almost all interpretations of the institution texts, according to Bart, except the Zwinglian. Whether we have to do with a sacramental view that renders the Last Supper a means of grace, in which Jesus is the giver and the gift, and so in a unique way that is necessary for all who believe in him and want to have a share in him. Bart does not believe that this is the case. And he thinks that this view only arises if you ditch the Passover framework of the meal of the Last Supper, as well as if you confuse two different modes of giving bread and misinterpret John 6, ideas that we will come back to later. More even than this, though, such a sacramental view ignores the fact, according to Bart, that the language of body and blood itself bespeaks the language of sacrifice. This reference to the body and blood not only indicates the death of Jesus to be violent, but also, in allusion to the body and blood of the Passover lamb, to be a sacrificial death. And Bart insists, this sacrifice of Jesus is once and forever sufficient. No repeat of this sacrifice is possible. Indeed, at the table of the Lord, there is no possibility even of presenting or representing the death of Jesus, whether symbolically or in any other way. Bart writes, the basis for eating bread and drinking wine is simply gratitude for God's gifts. If we step back for a moment, we see then that there's a careful dialectic in view here. On the one hand, the context of the Passover meal is determinative of what is happening, because the Last Supper is identified by Scripture in this way. On the other hand, the newness, the excess of the anticipated sacrifice of Jesus means a carefully controlled newness and excess within the context of celebrating that same meal. Another way of seeing this dialectic is to consider how Bart treats the language of covenant at this point. The sacrifice of Jesus is, for Bart, an act, a gift, a revelation made by God towards us. And more than simply referencing personal forgiveness or individual salvation, it indicates a new covenant. On the one hand, then, the blood of the covenant to which Matthew and Mark refer refers to a fulfillment, a closing, a surpassing, a completion of the Old Testament conclusions of the covenant. There's no more blood needed within this new covenant fulfilled in the sacrifice of Jesus. But on the other hand, this new covenant does not replace or contradict the former covenant. It's not another covenant with a different partner. Instead, Bart writes, it's the restitution, the crowning of the original love 
and marriage relationship. And thus the relationship between the two covenants is between glory and overflowing glory, in which this excess, this overflowing of glory, relates to the extension of the covenant to the Gentiles. And so at this table, not only is the reconciliation of individuals with God celebrated, but also the reconciliation of all peoples with God and with one another. And so Jesus Christ Bart concludes, did not come to annul the Passover, but to fulfill it on feast days and ordinary days. This motif of fulfillment is inseparable for Bart from the forward-looking note of promise. And there's a consistent eschatological beat throughout Bart's reflections here. The death of Jesus proclaimed in the Lord's Supper is for Bart an event that surpasses and eschatologically encapsulates all other historical events and experiences. What is given as a firm promise in participation in the Lord's Supper is that Christ's people will be eating and drinking with their Lord at the eternal table. And so our current celebration is a meal for migrants who have not yet reached their promised destination. But again, even this eschatological note, Bart finds to be not at all alien to the Passover of the Jews. By contrast, he writes, Christ's coming, the parousia, and Christ's eternal communion with God's people are the fulfillment of all promises and hopes given to Israel. Without losing focus, for one moment on this communion with Israel, Bart turns in the second chapter to focus on communion with Christ. He does so as he moves from exegeting the Passover and the institution narratives to considering the relevant Pauline texts, which he observed combine elements of confession, of narrative, of commentary, and of ethical or practical theology. The first text to receive detailed exposition is the notoriously complex verses 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17, which speaks of the communion with the body and with the blood of Christ. Of core interest for Bart here is the meaning of the word communion, both positively in respect of communion with Jesus Christ and negatively in respect of the communion with pagan altars. And it's of particular interest to Bart whether there's a straightforward relationship between these different types of communion. Certainly, according to Bart, Paul is fully convinced of the causative, effective, creative, in short, the sacramental power of pagan cultic actions. He's under no illusions about the danger which the pagan altars pose to the Christians of Corinth. And so the question immediately arises, does the act of the Lord's Supper have the same power? As Bart himself puts it, should now the Lord's Supper be effective, creative, causative, as pagan sacrificial meals indeed were, rather than significant and proclamatory as Israel's preservation in the wilderness and the Jewish priest's participation in sanctified food. The underlying question, parsing it in terms we've already encountered this morning, is this. Do we understand the Lord's Supper according to Greek or according to Jewish religion? Bart acknowledges that the Lord's Supper is intimate, existential communion between the participants in the meal and the person of Christ crucified. He writes, it means the death of the one Jesus Christ concerns so fundamentally those sitting at the table that they accept that his death is their death, that his suffering makes them willing and capable of suffering with him, that his resurrection promises theirs, that their life is in him as he is in them. And yet, 
Bard also clearly delineates that the word communion does not here mean a joining, a common essence or function of diverse things, unless, he writes, Paul has imposed upon it a meaning strange even to Greek-speaking people. But the question remains live, whether this participation in the sacrament is causative of communion in some way, or instead expressive, expressive in Bart's terms of a relationship to Christ that has been founded and made valid on the cross and in the resurrection, or through the Holy Spirit, the preached word, or faith. Bart suggests, somewhat modestly, that no answer can be reached on the basis of this particular text. It's too difficult, too ambiguous. And so he turns his Bible forward one page in the epistle and looks at the text from 1 Corinthians 11.26, in which verse those who celebrate the Lord's Supper are said to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And although he acknowledges that Paul himself does not here explicitly mention the Passover in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Nonetheless, neither does Paul deny it. And further, Paul himself is the one who refers to Christ as our Passover lamb. On 1 Corinthians 11 26, he observes that the center of the text is the proclamation of Christ's death. This proclamation is to be joyful. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ is God's greatest gift to humanity. And far from stopping at the horror of the crucified one, those who proclaim Jesus set forth also the glory of his resurrection. The crucified, he writes, is always the raised and living Christ. And far from being an individual event, the Lord's Supper is a corporate event. A community is the agent of proclaiming. And far from being an inward-looking event, the Lord's Supper is a missionary event and action. What is being celebrated, Bart writes, is neither the mystery of the Mass or the Church, nor the special authority of priests, but Jesus Christ alone. Here the whole congregation speaks. The distinction between clergy and laity is buried. And here, too, the mystery of the previous chapter is solved. As Bart writes, boldly formulated, the Lord's Supper is a human work that God has told us to do. More specifically, the dominical command in respect of the Lord's Supper is a command for action, a gathering, a prayer, a praying and proclaiming, an eating and drinking, in short, a joyful celebrating. Here then, the Lord's Supper is seen as a resounding celebration of the work of God, a joyful witness of the Christian community as a whole to the work of God accomplished in Jesus Christ. The phrase, until he comes, should not for Bart be taken to indicate either that Jesus Christ is not also present in the here and now of the Lord's Supper, or that he comes in a special way in the here and now of the Lord's Supper. Bart cautions, the reader looks in vain for the slightest trace of a statement that the Lord comes in or by the breaking of the bread during the Lord's Supper. Moreover, he continues, there is no reference to an invisible presence in the hearts of the believers that would be essentially or qualitatively different from Christ's presence during preaching, prayer, singing, and charitable acts. <clears throat> that Jesus is spiritually present, wherever two or three are gathered in his name is clear, but that this is unique to, or different in, the Eucharist, is for Bart simply not scriptural. Instead, for Bart, the communal eating and drinking are actions by which the disciples remember and proclaim Christ's death. And this act has consequences far beyond the table itself and its enactment of Christian sharing, serving, and loving. It also goes out into the world as a concern for social and economic justice, which, Bart writes, cannot be excluded from a genuine celebration 
of the Lord's Supper. I've spent some time working through the content of these first two chapters of Bart's book. The first describing the mysterious and wonderful communion with Israel, which Bart saw as the background to the Lord's Supper, and the second considering the crucifixion and parousia of Jesus as the event which encompasses all people that the Lord's Supper proclaims. The third chapter turns to speak of the communion among the participants of the Lord's Supper. Bart states robustly, there is no communion with Christ when the social community is considered irrelevant or of secondary import and is in fact broken up. Here again, the text of 1 Corinthians 10 to 11 is the primary source, with the Christological statements of the former being seen to connect inseparably with the ecclesiological statements of the latter. Again, Bart makes it clear that the Lord's Supper, as a human act, is an ethical event. He writes, ethics is its home, its framework and purpose, perhaps even its essence. Again, he writes, the Lord's Supper is a missionary manifestation of Jesus Christ's life and rule. For this reason, it is in essence a festival of love, in which the weaker and poorer members of the community find respect and honour. Bart goes in some detail into these dimensions of the Lord's Supper, linking them explicitly to Jesus' own practice of table fellowship during his lifetime and the inclusive and open table fellowship that he celebrated. The connection is crystallised for Bart in terms of the present, as he presents the ramifications of the Lord's table and its feast day extending out into the lives of its participants in the everyday It is for Bart a gift from God which points the way and strengthens us on our way to loving God by loving our neighbours. And so in the Lord's Supper he writes, all is ethical. However, he cautions, only evangelical ethics, not legalistic ethics, fit and express the praise that Christians owe to God and the testimony that they are to give to each other and to those who do not yet believe. And then in the fourth chapter, Bart turns to the witness to Christ of John 6. Having demonstrated, he thinks, that the New Testament contains two or three convergent testimonies concerning the Lord's Supper, he now raises a problem. Namely, the Johannine writings seem to give not only a different, but an opposite testimony on all vital issues. In other words... The Johannine writings have regularly been considered to set forth a causative and effecting sacramentology. But after intensive exegesis, whose substance lies beyond the scope of this paper, Bart is led to the conclusion that the appearance of contradiction is mere semblance. The key, he writes, is to interpret John 6 metaphorically and not sacramentally. The text speaks of the incarnation and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who brings life, and of the faith that is the proper response from our side to him. All this rather than of the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Rather than the bread and the wine being the agents of our inclusion, instead our inclusion in and knowledge of the work of Christ is affected by what Bart memorably describes as the double power line or lifeline of word and spirit. It is these, word and spirit, not bread and wine, that Barr describes as God's own means of grace. Jesus Christ, correspondingly, is the one and only sacrament. Let me try and draw together then some of the various strands of Bart's argument that are radical and perhaps instructive. For Bart, the Lord's Supper involves no transformation of earthly elements, no means of grace, no representation of Christ's death, no sacrificial altar, and no clerical caste. Instead, there is a table at which all believers meet and gather to remember the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus and to proclaim his name, 
in a celebration witnessing to love, gratitude and joy amidst the suffering of the congregation and the suffering of the world. In conventional terms, this is clearly a low doctrine of the Lord's Supper, one which rejects the sacramental view of the doctrine that has governed much of the tradition. It rejects not only the high sacramentality of the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, but also the more modest sacramental paths of Luther and Calvin. At the same time, it's a doctrine of the Lord's Supper which bespeaks the centrality and the significance of this celebration in the life of the church. Importantly then, a lack of sacramentalism does not in any way equate with a lack of importance. It's intriguing to comment briefly here on the theological journey which Marcus Barth had himself travelled to reach this position. In his earlier work, from some 40 years later, some of the same instincts had been present. There were, as I've noted already, the same set of laments. But there were also the same desires to root the understanding of the Lord's Supper in the Jewish Passover, to avoid notions of a transformation of the elements, and to abandon errant philosophical baggage. However, there were marked formal differences. The structure of the earlier work was organised around three different conceptions of the meal. Passover meal, covenant meal, and messianic meal. And it concluded with a series of concrete, practical suggestions. Even a suggested liturgy that Bart had already used in his own congregation. More important were the substantive differences. In the earlier text, Bart had written of the event of divine deed in human proceeding, being the miracle and secret of the Lord's Supper. He drew on the Lutheran trope of in, with, and under to explain this concurrence of divine action and human action in the sacrament. He spoke of the Lord's Supper as a making present of the death of Christ. And he spoke of the church as being constituted and reconstituted only in the Lord's Supper. He'd even at times tried to mediate between the Lutheran and Reformed traditions in a literally familiar manner. Small wonder that he later wrote, My own writing on the Lord's Supper of 1945 moved too much in the frame of the traditional understanding of the sacraments to allow an alternative to become truly visible. The seminary here and its archive of materials from Marcus Bart has Marcus Bart's own annotated copy of this 1945 heft of Theologische Studien. It was mentioned earlier today that Marx's own writing is very, very difficult to decipher. But there are question marks and there are big X's at various points in the text, which all can understand, which at least demonstrate the way in which his own thinking moved significantly. Of interest to me would be to discover what happened between 1945, when we have this reasonably magisterial Reformation theology reminiscent of Luther and Calvin, and 1953, only eight years later, when we have the publication of uh, Die Taufe and... Um, it's, it's very different understanding of sacramentology. Whether this was through experiences in the pastorate, through something he'd read, there's perhaps more uh, research and discovery to be done there. This all leads us finally towards a look at how Barth's very non-traditional account relates to the ecumenical movement and what potential it might bear. It's clear already that Marcus Barth dissented from the direction of travel of the ecumenical movement. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But he did recognize clearly the need for ecumenism. The closing words of his later work on the Lord's Supper are these, the one shepherd of the one flock invites all people to give thanks to God at one table. Indeed, the stated purpose of the text was ecumenical. He writes, a careful study of what the Lord's Supper was originally meant to be and what, after diverse developments, has become of it may contribute to the search for unity among divided churches. 
He sought to address existing divisions, existing separations, existing tensions, precisely as a theologian. Writing, insofar as theologians also understand themselves to be members of the pilgrim people of God, they share responsibility for the unity of that people. And prophetically, he called for the inclusion of Jews within ecumenical conversations, writing, wherever ecumenical unity is sought, Jews are indispensable participants in discussions. But though all was open to participating in ecumenical conversation, Bart was scathingly critical of the documents produced by the ecumenical ventures of his day. He recognized there had been bold and sincere attempts towards ecumenical agreement and mentioned not only the Lima Statement, Baptism, Eucharist and Ministry of 1982, but also the earlier work from conversations in Halle in 1937, Arnoldshain in 1957, and Leuenberg in 1973. Of all these labors, or at least of all their results, Bart was deeply suspicious. He wrote, one can ask whether in spite of the best intentions, anything more has been achieved than a mixtum compositum characterized by fatigue. He finds in all of these statements nothing more than what he describes as a version of the Tertullian, I don't know the adjective from Tertullian, Tertullian-esque and Augustinian sacramentalism and of the Greek understanding of mystery that has spread over all the churches, East and West, Lutheran and Calvinist. His profound criticism of the Lima document is famous and there's little doubt he would harbor similar anxieties about the successor to that document, the recent WCC publication, The Church Towards a Common Vision. Bart is clearly a dissenter on those fronts. Historically, Bart locates the beginning of division and the beginning of problem in the very earliest years of church history. He writes in his second work this, the influx of Greek dualistic philosophy the conscious or unconscious adoption of elements of the ancient mystery religions and accommodations to Roman legal thought and political institutions are found at the root of the divisions. And there is something of an irony here. For this charge of dualism, which Bart levels at the tradition of sacramental readings of uh, baptism and Eucharist, is regularly leveled precisely at people like Bart who advocate a rather low view of the sacraments. In any event, it's for this reason that the much vaunted ecumenical tool of ressourcement, or within the Reformed tradition, the recent trope of Reformed Catholicity, does not seem to be of fundamental import to his work. It is scripture and scripture alone which drives Bart's enterprise as its source and norm. Here too then, in his refusal to concur with the accepted ecumenical practice of eliding scripture and tradition into a new category of tradition with a capital T, Bart is clearly a dissenter. Of course, Bart knew he was ploughing a fairly lonely furrow throughout this enterprise. He's deeply aware that the teaching he sets forth is radically different from what is usually found in exegetical or dogmatic treatments of the Lord's Supper. He writes in his own words that people would not find it typically Reformed, Calvinist or Presbyterian. By his own admission, his friends on the theological road seem to have been Zwingli and his reading of the Apostles, and that was about it. We could doubtless add to the list of allies for sure, particularly today, by means of a variety of free church and Pentecostal traditions. But Bart certainly clearly recognised that the risk of further division in the church is enormous. So what do we make of this? Well, it's difficult to conclude that the work of Bart bears much promise for the ecumenical movement. That movement is on a different track. It has different presuppositions and different goals. It has little interest in accounts which do not conform to the high sacramental theology that is slowly coalescing as the broadly accepted norm. The consequence of dissent in the case of a theology of the Lord's Supper such as that of Marcus Bart 
is rejection and neglect. And correspondingly, it's unlikely that such a theology will make any headway in faith and order. However, as the ecumenical movement continues its journey, perhaps one concern of Marcus Bart might yet be heard. Regarding the Lima document, Bart observed, the simple accumulation and preservation of most of the existing high sacramental and ecclesiastical doctrines is a device by which churches try to boast of their riches rather than realize their poverty and repent of their errors and divisions. In such thinking, Bart worries, the full power to be a witness to Christ has been converted into the claim that the church is the rich and gracious mediator of grace and salvation. One must immediately say that participants in the ecumenical movement would disagree strongly with that analysis of their work and be appalled by it. But perhaps as they go forward, they might seek to learn or continue to learn from the positive message which it involves. Bard expresses a wish in respect particularly of the Lima document that the road to unity begins with repentance and the attainment of the desired goal requires a renewed outpouring of the Holy Spirit, an unstrained willingness to obey and follow the Lord alone and the final coming and revelation of Jesus Christ himself. For all that he descended from much of its work, perhaps Bart and the ecumenical movement could agree at least on that. Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.